My name is Simon Belles. I am from Colombia. I am an architect. My father was an architect from USA. First, he was an engineer here, but then he wanted to study architecture. There were not architectural studies here. So he studied in USA. And his father was not an architect, but was the equivalent because he was a builder and he used to build many construction as a business in the small village where I am from. So all of my workers, some of them are the grandkids, the grandsons of my grandfather and my father workers. And for me, it was very important to be awarded with the Prince Klaus because at the moment I got that award, the president called me to say congratulations about that award. And I told the president, Mr. President, you are going to sign a law that is going to ban the use of bamboo for the new building codes of Colombia. So he couldn't believe that. He called the environmental minister. He told him, yes, Mr. President, he's only waiting for your signature. And they were going to ban the use of bamboo in construction. So the president stopped that law and asked me to write the building code for bamboo. But I am not an engineer, so I hired an engineer who was in charge of that. His name is Luis Felipe Lopez, and now he's living in Filipinas as an engineer and doing bamboo work with the Liechtenstein Foundation, whose name is Hilti Foundation. Because of that award, the bamboo was not banned in the use of construction in Colombia. They were going to ban the use of bamboo. So many thanks to that award. I was born in 1949. So it means in the 68, that was the really the most important year in our lives. I became kind of a hippie but I am a hippie who doesn't smoke marijuana and who plays golf, but I am a hippie. Because of that global movement that I became kind of a hippie, we were very interested in working with natural materials, not to save the world. We were not thinking on that. There was not that global warming attitude that is happening now. It's just because we really like it, free love and natural materials. The idea was not to save the world, I say it again. It was just to work with those natural materials because it makes her more comfortable, more happy. So I started working with those materials, but not with bamboo, with wood. I was really interested in being kind of a barefoot architect working in the countryside because my family comes from the countryside, but as a landlord, not as a peasant. So the idea was to do houses in the countryside made mainly with, with wood. Then a German client forced me when I was very young to work with bamboo. I was born almost in a bamboo forest, but I was never interested in bamboo because bamboo is hollow and because I was part of that stigma that bamboo is only for the poor. It's a poor people wood. So I was forced by that, by that German guy. And with my workers at that moment, we were trying to do something out of bamboo. Then I realized that if I pour cement mortar inside the hollow bamboo, where the joints happens, where I need to use the straps, iron straps and iron bolts, the, the bamboo be, becomes not a hollow material, it becomes a solid, material and cement anchors very well with the bolts, with the joinery, with the iron joinery. So that very simple and stupid discovering allowed me to build huge bamboo structures. So after that discovering of how to do proper joinery, then bamboo started to become for me like vegetable steel. And I was the first to talk about that. The most important client has not been the humans, has been horses. Our holy animals in Colombia are the horses. Like in India, they are the cows. We really love horses. I have built many bamboo structures for horses and I really enjoy doing it. Also, some of our dogs 
we have built some houses for them. So it's also another important client. In a country like Colombia, we really hate bamboo. It means poor people material, only very poor people uses bamboo. And the people who hate it the most are the poor people. Once they have some money, they start building concrete structures. Also, architects hate bamboo. Engineers, the academic work in general, they really hate bamboo. It is considered a very poor people material. Um, but I don't care. I grow up with bamboo forest around and I have not that stigma. And I was telling before, I was forced by a client to discover how to work with bamboo. And then I realized it once I discovered how to do proper joinery, that bamboo is much more stronger than wood. And there are some engineers that who says that bamboo is even more strong than concrete. I'm happy just saying, not concrete, steel. I'm happy saying bamboo is as strong as steel, but bamboo fibers can be even stronger than steel fibers from the best quality. The largest bamboo structure I have ever built was the bamboo pavilion at Expo Shanghai. But also I built a bridge, a pedestrian bridge here in Colombia, and both of them are 36 meter wide. No, the bridge here is 40 meters, 40, 40. So that is the biggest bamboo structure I have ever done. But that bamboo structure had huge troubles because of engineering. The engineer that was hired to do the footing, he was thinking, ah, that is just a bamboo work of a hippie. He didn't pay attention of the strength that was taken by that bamboo bridge. They were the same that any other kind of bridge. So the footing started opening and that was really a big trouble. So I had to do kind of a liposuction to that bridge. I have to take out the clay tiles of the roof and that was 70 tons. I have to take out the concrete where you walk because it was done in concrete. It was again another 70 kil uh, tons of material. So at the end, we took out 140 tons of weight. And after that, the bamboo was working very well because they were done loading tests and they showed the bamboo was working. There, are, there is not really bamboo engineering. There is starting to happen. But at those times, there was zero bamboo engineering. And it's very important to do mathematics about the behavior of those bridges because you can kill a lot of people. You have a huge responsibility where, when you build, especially with bridges. So there was first for the structure we built in Germany. It was like 20 something years ago, 20 years, two years ago for the year 2000. There was a German engineer who was hired to do the loading test. And he did loading tests, not destructive. He didn't was, wanted to tear down the building to damage the building. So I learned how to do kind of loading tests in my way, but it was a, a very sophisticated engineer. So he did the loading test for that building in Colombia. And again, because we built a prototype here with that purpose, and again in Germany. And in Germany, it was even better the results because he had better tools to do it, not because of the building was better done. It was the same. It was with the same skillful people. And he said, that building, I cannot believe, is taking the load without problems. And it's not because of your design. It's because of the skill of the workers. It's really well done. Well, when I do international work and I have to send workers, I take big care not taking the marijuana workers, smokers. The best workers I have, they smoke marijuana, but I take big care not to send them 
to the outside because it has that stigma that everything coming from Colombia has drugs. So they train the local people and they have not had any trouble by training them. I have never been interested in what we call modern architecture. I only like old architecture. Doesn't matter if it is cultural, high cultural architecture or vernacular architecture. And I am really impressed by vernacular architecture all over the world if it is old. But if it is new, the vernacular architecture that you see everywhere is horrible. It is as horrible as the modern architecture for me. Doesn't matter in which country you are. What was the most beautiful building you've ever seen? Anywhere? I think the most beautiful building I have ever seen was inside the Forbidden City in China. I couldn't believe the height and the well-done structure that those buildings had and also the proportions. It was really a big teaching for me, having been in China looking at those buildings. And I was hired, I was not being, I was not there as a tourist. I was going to build something very big in the Forbidden City. But it was never built, but it was for the same artist that I built his huge structure in bamboo in El Zócalo in Mexico. The idea was to do something also as big as that in Beijing and it was going to happen inside the Forbidden City, and it was going to be sponsored by the Chinese government. But then came the chicken flu, and that was cancelled. My first trip as an adult was going to Bali. I was really impressed traveling to Indonesia. And being there, I realized that just in Bali, there were like six or seven or eight different styles of vernacular architecture, so beautiful, each one of them. And Indonesia is about 13 or 14,000 islands, and each island has a different language and many different vernacular styles, and all of them, they are so beautiful. I never imagined that there was so much variety in that vernacular architecture, and it was really a sophisticado architecture. I was very impressed by that. I live in La Candelaria because when I was a student, my father gave me some money to buy an apartment. But I was a hippie in those times and still now. And I decided to buy a house in La Candelaria, which is the area where the Spaniards arrived to make the actual city as it is looking today. It was also a big, it was already a big populated city, but in the indigenous way. The houses didn't touch each other. But the Spaniard way was with the squares and houses touching each other. So I have kind of a big area because I have bought more land after my father gave me that, that house. So I have a big garden, a big area, and I have built there many different structures since I was young. I keep working on it. and Everything here has been done illegally, but I take big care to make it safe structures. So the history of my architecture since I was very young until the days of today, it is already done here. In every period I have built something. So it's kind of a, a autobiographic uh, architectural place for me. Well, I pay big attention to gardening, but I like wild gardening. I don't like manicure gardens. And you don't have a garden if you don't have water on it. So water is really important in gardening but living water, I don't like the abstract use of water that has not life, has not algae, has not fishes, that is perfectly clean. I like dirty water. It has to be real rainy water. So 
those ponds are live and the ponds they need to have fishes for you to understand if the life is if the water is okay or not long time ago i discovered the french paper and also the german pencils before i used to work with colombian paper which is horrible because the most important tool when i am working are is the eraser so a bad quality paper you erase what you are drawing and everything gets destroyed with those french papers i can erase and erase and nothing happens to the paper and for me it's very important to work in that kind of notebooks they are grill notebooks and every time well, those are different projects i am doing it's in pencil once I am sure, I do them in ink. Let me show you. This is the process of designing a construction. But at some point, I do... I, I don't found the ink. There was ink here. Ah. Here, I have already it drawing the drawings in in ink, because I'm sure is that is the design. I do those drawings, especially for the workers, not even for the client, but I show them to the client also. But it's not to get a building permit, it's just to understand how the structure is and to explain to the workers. I also give those drawings to the engineers. That was in Qatar for, for cows and for horses. Because of COVID, my work stopped completely. I had zero work except something I built one year ago in Mexico, in Carelles, which is in the Pacific Ocean. I managed to send a Colombian worker, only one. Usually that was needing about eight or 10 Colombian workers, but it, it was only possible to send only one of them. And because of those new technologies of communication, it was possible for me to be talking every day with the, with the worker, with the skillful worker, and without paying a penny, because it was through WhatsApp. And it was really interesting for me to do that because I was every day talking to the worker and looking the construction site because that guy was sending me photos and video every day. So that has changed a lot the way I used to work. For example, today, Early in the morning, I was talking to Africa and giving a lecture to, to some people in Africa. That was not possible before. I used to have to travel long distances to give that lecture. That doesn't happen anymore. So it's a big advantage, that kind of things that were already existing, but it was speeded by that COVID because of the quarantine and we couldn't travel it was possible to keep working and doing things because of those new technologies of communication. Well, I was working doing a botanical tower in Cali, but came the COVID, the COVID and everything was stopped. And it was, it was a project that was closed for two years. Then we started back again and it's doing very well. It's kind of a governmental work, but it's not the government. The government is kind of a private thing that belongs to the government. So it is a very important work for me. Sophisticated work, complex, and it's a watchtower not to look at the landscape. It's to look the different levels of the plants in the canopy of the forest. It was pasture five years ago. Today, it's starting to be a kind of botanical garden. In the tropics, everything grows so fast that you cannot believe once you took out the cattle, the botanical garden starts growing by itself. It was planted mainly by the birds, but today it is a man-made garden and you can see the plants that have been planted there, but they are looking like in the wild. It's very interesting what they are doing there 
and also when you can testify the growing of that garden that is coming so fast. So that tower is to watch the canopy because many plants don't exist in the, in the ground. Many birds, many insects, you don't see them in the ground. You see them once you climb to the canopy of the forest. We have a very big biodiversity in Colombia because we have the Caribbean Ocean, which is the Atlantic. We have also the Pacific Ocean. We had huge mountains. We have the very important influence of Amazon River in the south. And we have also a very important influence of the Orinoco River in the border with Venezuela. So our biodiversity is huge. The only country who has biggest biodiversity is Brazil, but Brazil is like a continent. It's a huge country. This is not that big country. It's not small, it's not big, but our biodiversity is really very important. And I have the privilege to work in that biodiversity place. Mainly, most of my work has been built here in Colombia. And it's always in the countryside. So I always found indigenous Best, uh, ruins. When I dig for the footing of any building, I am very impressed how populated it was that country before. With my wife, whose name is Stefana Simic, we managed to do two years ago, almost three, a very interesting building in, in France. It was built by Vancy, which is the biggest building industry in, in France, I think in Europe, and you see them all over the world. And it was very interesting because it was a prefab bamboo structure. We prefab everything in Colombia, but we, dealt, we, we built a small prototype, real full scale for the engineers of France, who were two women, to come and check if the structure concept was working or not. And it was really important for us to do that building because it was a prefab structure built out with steel, cables, and also a lot of bamboo. But it was very interesting because we used a touch roof and the touch was from the south of France where we built that structure. And it was very interesting because once it was designed, I realized it, it was looking like a maloca, which were the very old, big communal buildings where the indigenous people used to live. In those buildings, they had not only the purpose for living, it was kind of a religious building also. And everything, all the community was living inside the same building. It was a huge house. Well, it used to be a, a very big house with all the community lives inside but it's also the holy place. Well, it was prefab here in Colombia, so I imagine I were going to send some workers to France and they were not allowed to go. There was only one and it was like a tourist. He was never inside the building. He was not allowed by the laws for the workers there in, in France the governmental laws. He was kind of a tourist. And the most interesting of that is that all the workers, the engineers, everybody was coming from producing a, an atomic plant. And it was kind of a rest for them to work in a hippie bamboo structure. And it was very interesting to have all those people working, coming from a very high end technology building to work in a bamboo structure and it was so well done. I was surprised how precise they were and how accurate work they did. One year ago, we were working for Qatar, but that was stopped by the pandemic times. Well, actually it was two years ago. And we produced a laminated bamboo structure for nomadic purposes. It was going to be temporary bamboo structures built in the ancient way, but it was very modern because Qatar was the one of the most poor countries 100 years ago, 
and today by far it is the richest country in the world. So they wanted to have the memory of the living as nomadic people in the desert. But we are not anthropologists. We were not trying to build a museum or how they used to live. We just realized it, that we were doing something very modern in our way, using laminated bamboo, and we discovered how flexible, how a beautiful material, how a strong material it is when you work with laminated bamboo. And also it's the only way to treat properly the bamboo without using any chemicals, just the heat. So it goes so high the temperature that it is not edible anymore for the box. It's not a poison wood, it's just that it, it is not edible anymore after those high temperatures. But you can destroy the structural qualities of the wood or the bamboo if you go too high into that temperature. It needs a lot of trial and error to arrive to that temperature. And also, we could prefab the structure because it was laminated. And it was prefab in Colombia. We shipped everything, including the drawings, of course. And it was an Italian team in Italy building it back again without our help. It was necessary, it was not even necessary to have videos or filming or, or photos. They built it just with the drawings and it was okay for them to build it without any troubles. We did a long trip to Morocco to study the traditional way of weaving. So we used those techniques of fabrics for Morocco, but the Moroccan people couldn't travel to Venice because of COVID. So the only way we found was an Iranian guy who, was used, who used to work in those textiles and he was living in Venice at that moment. But because of that Iranian guy, it was possible to build that textile bamboo structure. That, but the textile were built in Morocco before. Since I am very young as an architect, my hero has always been Andrea Palladio. I really love all his old buildings and traveling to Venice, I managed to meet some of his buildings. And this time, the place to build that structure that we call the Majolist, which was a bamboo, laminated bamboo structure covered with Moroccan textiles. It was built in the backyard of a Palladian building. So it was really a honor for me to work in a Palladian place in a real place of Palladium. It was a football field. It was a place for the priests. They used to live like 2000 years before. Now only four of them are living in a huge building. And, and the building is even, it was built before, long before Palladio. What Palladio built there was the church. But it was that huge building with a very big patio and it used to be a football field covered with concrete, with cement. So the Qatarian project took out the concrete. That project hired an architect from England and that architect was never happy when everybody called him a landscape architect. He was always explaining, I am a gardener. So he planted an edible garden for the priests where it used to be a football field and where we built that majorist. So it was very nice to see the beauty of that garden that was built in the way it, they were built 300 years ago. When I first started working with those natural materials because I was kind of a hippie, I am still an old hippie. But in those times, the idea was not to save the planet, it was just to use natural materials. Now we have to save the planet because of the global warming that is caused by the human activity. Before it was caused by volcanic activity, by very big objects coming from the outside of the world. But now it's the human activity who is producing that pollution all over the world, changing the weather changing the climate 
and natural materials are a very important alternative in that purpose. So because of that, mainly because of that, that kind of thing are becoming kind of a religious movement, but also a fashion. So to work with natural materials helpfully is becoming kind of a fashion because of that global warming. But when I was young, I was never thinking in that kind of things, but that is happening. That Prince Klaus Award was very important for me because it was not an architectural award. It was even much more important. It was a cultural award. And it is an award that goes to those countries that are not considered the developed countries. But for humanity, for culture, it doesn't matter if you were born in Europe or in Asia or in South America or North America, it really doesn't matter. Now communications, put all the talents together, doesn't matter where you are from. And culture is really very important. It's much more important than what I work as an architect, that a doctor works as a medical doctor, or like an engineer working as an engineer, or a writer working as a writer. Culture is everything. And the access to culture is also very important to everybody.